Welcome to 2023. It's a new year. Time for a refresh and a refocus on what's important to you. Ross and I want to take the opportunity to say mahalo. Thank you for your listenership as we continue to move forward in our powder coating journey, which is your powder coating journey. Have you learned anything new? Wow, I know I have and feel so much more confident. We're taking a break from the usual routine today to focus on new products, specifically job shop attachments that can increase your productivity and lower your frustration level. Joining me is Scott Coates from Coatings by Coates. He's got some new products guaranteed to blow your mind. Get ready to level up your powder coating game. I'd like to introduce uh, a guy we've been talking to for a while in the background, Scott Coates. I think you are technically the unofficial MVP of the year uh, (laughs) for product innovation. And I wanted to get you in before the end of the year. It's a couple days before the new year. And I think this is just such a great time to kind of talk and just start off the year with a bang on new products. So welcome to the show, Scott. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> now, um, you, let's just talk about briefly, just about your top, uh, you know, why we're here today. It's new products. And you have an innovation that is kind of taking Instagram, TikTok, and uh, everywhere else that I'm seeing you uh, kind of by storm because everybody is ordering it using it, trying it out, and then, I mean, the videos, and now they're showing others what they're using, using your product. So what is your product? And then we'll get into your story right after that. So we offer, you know, a small variety of products right now, and actually intend to improve upon that uh, even more next year. But primarily it's focused around doing two-tone wheels and two-tone powder coat schemes uh, using vacuum tools. Uh, which has been, you know, it's been around forever, but I, I've just uh, tried to make it easier for people to, to get access to like a complete kit and added some new features in. Um, my eyesight's not the best in the world, so having a, a lighted uh, tool helps me tremendously. And I thought when I first uh, started working on this, I thought, uh, you know, this works pretty good for me. I, I wonder if others would like to have this. Uh, so then I I uh, started touring around with releasing the products. But anyway, it's mostly around different uh, types of tools using uh, vacuum, whether it's through a shop vac type setup or uh, one of our other products is a pneumatic uh, shop vac that works with no uh, no electricity at all, basically, and just uses shop air to uh, and suction uh, method to remove powder from objects. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen really quick because I want everybody to kind of see, and we're going to go over to your Instagram, which pretty much is kind of like a good page to uh, see everything. Um, Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, So this is your uh, kind of a hub for you uh, to kind of showcase what you do. Uh, you, You obviously are doing a rim here. Um, and this is kind of a newer t- tool. This is like uh, kind of doing a, a lot of the bulk of the work. Uh, yeah, this is an extractor kit is what you're calling it. Yeah. Yeah, this is a powder extractor kit. Basically, it's got a, a piece of foam on the end uh, that does the wiping motion, what you would typically do with something like a microfiber rag or, mm-hmm. or some sort. And it has a suction right there at, at its disposal. So it pulls the powder in right away. Uh, this product is is very simple, and I can't believe that someone hasn't come up with something like this already. Uh, but, you know, every day that I'm in the shop working, I'm always looking for some way to make life easier for myself as, and other powder coaters as well. And this tool, although it's something that's pretty simple, this is going to be a, a very good time saver for people. Uh, it is. I mean, obviously, areas. you can see how fast it removes everything. And it's, I guess it's large enough. But then 
uh, with the sucking motion, is this just attached to a, like a shop vac? Yes, that's atta attached to a shop vac here. That's the shop okay. vac hose you see in it. So basically we have the adapter that adapts it to the end of the shop vac and holds the foam piece. Right. Uh, uh, Which kind of looks like that microphone, like a micro uh, a microphone type cover, like a foam cover to a microphone uh, yes. and stuff. But uh, this is like it, it does take away a lot of the work and makes it a little fast. And then do you come back in over this uh, with a more finer tool? It, it depends on what you're using it on. Uh, I've noticed that some powders tend to still hold on to the powder you're trying to remove a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, where it really excels is on if you're doing, a say, like a polished wheel and you're doing part of a powder cutting like the back of the wheel and the front of it you're leaving polished. Removing the powder from a uh, just a, a clean metal surface, it really pulls that off uh, good. There's some uh, GTR engine covers in there that I'm uh, oh, showing a demonstration on. Which and, one is uh, that? Did I pass it? Go, go back up. I think it's closer to the top. Okay, over to your, go back down, over to the left. This, These? Oh. The second row on the left, where it second. says powder extractor kit. Uh, there you go. That one, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. and this also shows off uh, the, the small extractor, what we call the, the junior. Yeah. And then it, uh, later in the video, it shows the bigger one being used, but on raw aluminum like that, it really pulls the powder off good and clean. Right. Uh, to where really you don't have to, do, as long as you can get into the, the corners and the cracks and crevices and get it all out, you really don't have to do anything afterwards. And I find it amazing that it actually, I mean, if you're careful, and I, I know you're kind of speeding up for video purposes, but, or posting yes. purposes, but like, um, I'm so, it's, it's, I think what's amazing about this tool is that unless you're actually going around to the front or the side of this object, it's really only just taking what's right in front of it, right? You know, yeah. um, and that's what you always have to worry about, like when you're doing these two-tone or uh, powder extraction kind of situations, you know? Yeah, and that's a, that's the whole, you know, theory behind this item and the uh, foam, I mean, the uh, uh, flexible attachments that I have as well, you know, so mm -hmm. you're basically using the tool to wipe with it, and the suction comes from a convenient location uh, right by where you're wiping, so it pulls it off immediately. Yeah. Keeps, yeah. It, and you, it'll keep it from dropping on, the on, say, the lip of the wheel or other areas where you don't want the powder to fall on, which is real common when you're trying to wipe it with your hand or, um, you know, other means. And this is another tool, right, that you have. You That yellow thing there that you just saw is actually something you made to kind of house all these tools. Um, yes. So this is a lighted tool uh, to really get. And this is brilliant because, you know, everybody wants this two-tone look now. And it's hard to get into these less deeper, uh, you know, etched uh, rims. Not everybody yes. has the deeper weld rims or deeper lettering. Um, right. and yeah. so it's, 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 it's great to get this kind of, and it's all lighted and everything. How handy and convenient can that be? Yeah. There, there's another video where I literally show me taking it out of the box and putting it to use in less than a minute. That's how convenient oh, wow. it is. Now that wow. that's really designed for doing small jobs that are small, mm -hmm. quick jobs where you don't want to have to deal with the hassle of dragging your shop back out and plugging it in and getting you know, your right. tools set up. You have that right. where it's convenient. You grab it, throw it on your booth wall wherever you're trying to work. And, you know, in less than a minute, you're able to uh, start removing powder uh, in the desired area. And, and the it, first you know, put, thing you... It's back up just as quick. Yeah. The first thing that I think you, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but the first thing that I thought that you uh, had developed was a light to ha to be housed or slipped onto the gun, right? Was that the yeah, first thing you made? Yeah. The first product was here. a light. A light. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of videos on that. Yeah. Uh, I think that video of the booth holster does show it on there. If you scroll down a little further, there there should be one. Yeah. Two down there. Is it this there's one? one for the. Uh, those show oh, no, it. They don't really cover, show it in yeah. use. Yeah, go down right. a little further. Further. 
Oh, here we go. We found it. There you go. There you yeah. Go. And what kind of gun is this that you're using? I'm using a Gamer Pro in here. Um, that was obviously the first one to offer. I have a Gamer Optiflex uh, 2B as well. So mm -hmm. I was able to create those uh, pretty quick and put those out on the market. I've since uh, gotten them for some of the older Gamas, uh, the Cool Code Omega guns, uh, some other Columbia guns as well. Uh, the uh, Kremlin that's uh, starting to catch traction and get a little popular, uh, Sprint, uh, Wagner gun, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the Gimas cross over to some of the, the copy guns, you know, mm -hmm. like the right. uh, Colo uh, and some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is this all goes back to, you know, not having the best eyesight and I need a little <laughs> more light to make my life easier. Right. And what 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 it's hard to get across to people on something like this is uh, if you have a light spot in, in one wheel on a set of wheels that you're doing and you have to redo them, if this prevents that on one set of wheels, it's paid for itself. You know, oh, totally. you know, you know by, t by the time you strip them, you know, go through the whole process again and recode them, you know, so j just having that extra light really save. Save you Especially that. in the rim that you're doing, because look how deep the, ed, you know, that inside edging is, you know, where you can easily miss uh, that little crevice or Faraday area. You know what I mean? It's uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's easy, especially with so many on this rim. So this is actually a really excellent yeah. video to just kind of show you because not all rims are easy to coat, you know? Um, uh, yeah. So pretty, that's how I picked complex. up on yeah, on you. And then it uh, looks like you've got one here for uh, uh, just regular spray gun. Yeah, that's for the Iwata uh, LPH-80. That's a real popular gun that people use for Cerakote. Prismatic mm -hmm. Powders actually sells it off their website. Mm -hmm. So uh, believe it or not, that's actually the first light I put up for sale. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and a Cerakote group because uh, I was really – really happy with the way it worked out and thought, you know, others might like that. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 in parallel, I had the ones in the works for the powder coating guns as well, but that one was uh, actually the first one to sell. Now, what's this? Or that well, was that's a, a booth. Okay. Yeah, that's a booth holster. Um, you know, if you've got your powder coating gun towards the front of your booth and you have a bar uh, up towards the filters and you're you're coating a lot of small parts on that bar rather than coating them on a rack it it's kind of cumbersome trying to hang on to the gun and move parts around or, or yeah. swap parts out on the rack so you know you have to run back to where your 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 unit's at and put the gun back up it's real easy to be in a hurry doing that and i think probably the general consensus is the hooks uh with the way that gema has them designed they're not the they're just easy to to miss that hook, mm -hmm. especially if you're in a little bit of a hurry. So then your gun drops, you've broken your gun. Yeah. So I thought this would be a good idea. And also the filter on the end of this particular one helps contain the uh, old powder when you're purging your gun to clean it out. So this one comes in two different versions. You can get the uh, one with the filter attachment on it, or you can get what I call a... a the small booth holster where it just holds the gun itself and doesn't have the filter attachment. Right. Not everybody wants a filter attachment, so, you know, gave them two options on that. Right. But that's one of them products that you don't realize how handy it is until you don't have it. Uh, right. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to hard to convey that sometimes. It is. Um, I think that that sometimes can be when you're innovating something new, uh, <laughs> you are actually creating an industry uh, in it, in and of itself, right? Uh, and I think that that is a little harder to get into the marketplace that way because, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, everybody's wanting these two tones. So, you know, we understand yeah. the difficulty and the headache of doing something like this, especially when they're popular now, you know, people just automatically expect that because you're a powder coater, you already know how to do this, <laughs> you know, a two tone. And uh, there's a lot that goes, a lot of thought that goes into it, right? 
Yeah, a lot uh, of people think it's real real easy. You know, you just put one color on and put the other color on in a couple hours and it's done. But it's, it's far from that. Right. I think this is, uh, is this a good one to show people in regards to the t tips that you came up with too? Because you've got the tips now for, is it just the Gima guns or any kind of gun? Uh, it's just the Gima guns now. I'm working on one for the Omega guns, but I haven't had a chance to uh, uh, get that one finished yet. But yeah, here, most of my products are because there's a need for something that doesn't exist mm -hmm. now i had i actually had had made a quick prototype nozzle i don't know probably a year ago just playing around with my 3d printers but i never really did anything with it it's in the world of 3d printing you don't want to try to replicate something that already exists you don't want to duplicate something because it's usually cheaper to get something that's already made True. So I never really pursued it any further. But one day, my gun slipped out of my hand, and it damaged the tip on my gun. And uh, I told the wife, you know, go ahead and get another one on order. I had one, a backup in stock, uh, put on the gun. But it's just always our common practice. Keep something for backup. Once you use that, get another one uh, at right. the shop so we have it. Well, she calls our local rep uh, that sells the GEMA products, and they were no longer there. Uh, oh. I'm not sure what what happened if Gema pulled them or if the company that was um, the local rep pulled the department. But anyway, they disappeared. So uh, suddenly, I'm faced with the fact that we can't get parts local anymore. Uh, you know, if something comes up mm -hmm. and we need something in a hurry. So I said, well, maybe I should go ahead and finish developing that tip uh, just so I have it in case of a, of some kind of situation like that. And Really, just that, that was just for my own personal benefit at the time. Uh, but once I got to working on it, I thought, you know, there are some improvements that can be made here. And one of them is finding a different material that's more shock resistant. So I started pursuing that and uh, playing around with a bunch of different materials. People may think that I come out with these products and, you know, that, that it just all happens easy. But it, it's no different than the, doing a two-tone wheel. I had to spend a lot of time working on it. Uh, I printed probably 40 of those out before I finally got to a design I was happy with. Uh, because once, once I start the process, I tend to find things that I, I like to change as I'm, uh, going along the way. And one of them obviously was to make it more stronger and more impact resistant so it could survive a drop. And once I did that, then I was just looking at other aspects. What else could I do to make it better? And the, the OEM piece, has a bunch of sharp edges on it and i thought you know it, it, it's easy for me to now to tweak that design and see if i can basically add some better aerodynamics to it and that's what i did and by doing that it now has a better cloud versus the oem unit without changing anything on your gun so you simply put this uh, new nozzle in and it's got better drop protection on your gun and not just the tip on your gun as well you know uh, and also it performed better so it's a better performing all around. And it's actually a little bit cheaper than the GEMA OEM part as well. You know, um, I have a bit of confession to make because a few months ago, I was at SEMA and I got to sit down uh, to dinner with some of the GEMA people. Later on, um, after dinner, you know, uh, we continue to kind of hang out, uh, a few of us. And your, uh, we kind of started talking about maybe thinking about doing a podcast and, you know, what are the today's topics and stuff. And I was just so thrilled to have like, uh, you know, just having the audience of someone that works for GEMA, right? We, we're, we're Wagner right. people, but just, you know, I thought, wow, okay, I got to, what's my opportunity here to kind of talk about a subject matter and you were the subject matter because, you know, <laughs> my complaint was why does it cost so much for a GEMA? Why does it, why can't you guys make a mid-level gun, uh, an intermediate gun, whatever. I mean, I asked this to any gun manufacturer I can get a, a hold of. Right. And so I had a captive mm -hmm. audience and I thought, you know, like, this is my chance, my opportunity, especially like a few cocktails in. 
Um, and I, I did show your, you know, and they were the, the, the gentleman I was talking to was aware of your product. Um, I don't know how aware he was, but he had seen right. the video before and stuff and they do pay attention. I don't know if they hear us or listen to us, uh, as custom coders, but I think they, they are seeing us. And so I showed him, I think I showed him this very video and he goes, well, yeah, but you know, um, now just remember this guy is more in the distributor type, mid levels type. He's not the top brass or low, lower either, you know, uh, in the company. But, you know, I showed him this video and he goes, well, what about, you know, like, you know, uh, and this is just some of the conversation or topics that they were coming up with, I guess, in watching your video was like, well, what about, um, you know, back ionization and this and that, and, you know, all this stuff, have you had any back ionization issues? How, and if you have, how, how have you resolved them? Obviously this is a more rubbery type product because it's bouncing versus the plastic part or piece. Um, am I correct right. on that? Yes. Um, there, there is, it just performs better than their nozzle all, all around. Uh, you know, you can have back ionization with any gun, any True. any nozzle, any powder, if you're not not applying it correctly, I say that. But this one works better than the OEM nozzle. It it's less back ionization. It has a better cloud. The better cloud creates less back ionization, um, and it also. As far as improvement goes, it's probably a, a 5% improvement. Maybe that's a little conservative number, but that's what I try to tell people. It's a 5%. It's not twice as good or anything like that. Right. Uh, you know, you're, you're really buying this because of the uh, effect of dropping your gun, you know, right. and you get a little bit of benefit out of it. But exactly. one thing I did notice that I have noticed about it is the wraparound effect that it has. So, you know, you're shooting, shooting a part. You know, think of a bike frame, you're shooting a bike frame, and you go to the other side of that piece, and that powder has wrapped around better, considerably better, I think, than uh, the OEM nozzle does. I'd say that's, I'm not a, gonna, that's a good improvement. Yeah, definitely. And I'm not going to claim that I did anything based off any engineering uh, background uh, it was pure. It really is just pure luck that it performed better. You know, just looking at some basic things. Hey, you can improve the aerodynamics. Surely, that should improve the overall performance of it, and it did. Yeah. You know, so there were no no calculations, no formulas, no nothing like that. Just you know, basically looking at the thing and trying to analyze what could be uh, done to improve it. Well, I think you know you're being really humble here, Scott. Um, I think when people see videos like this, um, I think they're probably getting more than 5% improvement on a part. And it's certainly worth the upgrade um, just oh, yeah. in seeing the videos and stuff like that. I don't know how much you charge. Uh, we can head over to your Etsy shop and stuff here towards the end of the video but uh, and podcasts. But, um, you know, I, I would say judging by the comments like for instance easy powder coating <laughs> take all my money uh i'd say you're doing a better than about a 10 percent. you're probably doing more like 20 25 at least uh and stuff but uh i think that to me i think that innovation is um important always for our industry no matter what level uh anybody is at uh, secondly, I think that GEMA, and I don't try to pick on GEMA at all, or just let's just say any of them, any of the big major companies out there, Wagner, GEMA, Intelliflex, or uh, Parker Ionics, and the other one, I forgot. Um, I think they're so busy solving really, really big problems that they're not thinking of going back to any original piece that they've solved and try to solve it even better, right? You know, um, do, do you agree or disagree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, not that they don't want to sell to the individuals like myself and many other custom coders. Their target market is really probably the big industrial shops, you know, 
what's more important, selling one gun to one person or a hundred guns to a big industrial shop, you know? Right. But, you know, the point you made earlier about how this tip actually uh, wrap, you know, wraps the powder around to the other side, that actually is kind of significant, even as a simple statement, because now you're saving powder. Um, yeah. And anytime that they can save the manufacturer powder or any other kind of, um, you know, uh, waste shortage, whatever kind of problem, that's a, that's a significant problem to solve, uh, no matter how oh, small oh, yeah, it is. Definitely. Because we all know that the little, little, little uh, bits that get fallen on the floor or uh, thrown around, thro thrown away, um, can actually add up to thousands of dollars. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to say one thing about this tip. So mm -hmm. when I first first started using it, you know, like I said, the main pr priority uh, was to make sure that it was more impact resistant. And I started spraying with it. And I thought to myself, is this thing actually working better? Because, like I said, I didn't really, there was no engineering uh, background behind it. It was just me, you know, trying some different things. So I was actually, uh, you know, questioning myself at first. And uh, after using it for a couple of weeks, I, I knew for certain that it was. And, and the first ones I sent out, uh, the gentleman reported back immediately that it was, he noticed the difference and the other people were saying the same thing about it. So it made me feel good that, you know, I wasn't losing my mind. the only one? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hear well, it's my, my product. You know, right. that's my baby. I want it to be the best. Right. And uh, I, I was just hoping that I wasn't trying to read it too much into it. Uh, but clearly, oh, yeah. Believe the hype. Senses. Believe your own hype, basically. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I, for the most part, and I've interviewed quite a few custom coders, but uh, we're custom coders ourselves. It's like, for the most part, it seems like custom coders are a pretty humble type to begin with, right? <laughs> you know, and it's not because you don't start off being humble, but it's just the industry humbles you <laughs> when yes. they have to redo something 15 times or put it back in the stripper tank or whatever. I mean, the industry itself can humble you. So you have to be a humble person to begin with in order to survive, <laughs> you know, and, you know, don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Yeah, uh, absolutely. This, this <laughs> could be a, a, you know, you can be having a fantastic day one minute and uh, just completely destroy the next minute. <laughs> okay. I, I think that in itself is, a good topic for a podcast alone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, um, probably but so. I like I like the way I think that's what makes. And when I imagine you um, doing this, right? It, it's and and then coming up with these videos and everything like that. I imagine you're in this secret lab somewhere <laughs> deep in your basement or whatever. Okay, but I think it's really cool uh, that you are able to take the, you know, you have this thing that you do, this lab, let's just call it Scott's lab, and you're able to kind of just get real intimate with the part that you're working with and, and perfect it that way. And, and you're doing it through experimentation, you're doing it through, um, you know, uh, scalability, right? You're not getting too deep into it. You're you're testing it and then uh, getting feedback from, you know, your your audience or your buyers and then improving on that. I think that's awesome. And that's the way to scale. Uh, that's how tech scales, right? Uh, if you're doing an app or something like that, that's how they, that's the whole, like, uh, what is it called? Uh, the The business model for tech. People. I'm thinking of, I'm trying to think of the name of it right now and it's escaped me, but um, that's how they do it. Yeah. So I think that's great. Uh, do you have a secret lab? I do have a room set up that uh, is, you know, some people might call it the man cave. I don't really call it that because uh, <laughs> it's filled with a computer and a desk and uh, 3D printers and laser machine and a few other toys. Uh, but, but I do have room dedicated to it. 
Uh, I didn't initially, you know, because it wasn't at the point I'm at now with it. But eventually, I've taken over uh, one of our spare bedrooms, and that's my that's my sanctuary, if you will. A lot of people they go home and they want to forget work, and not necessarily a power cutter. I'm talking about a person in general, you know, might work a regular nine to five job, and they want to forget about work. They want to go watch TV, go sure. hang out with friends or whatever. I'm not like that. I hardly watch any TV. Uh, if I'm doing something, I want to be doing something to improve um, myself or my means to put food on the table or, or whatever you want to call it. I'm just not a person that sits around and watches much TV. Never really have been. Always been active and doing stuff. I mean, I, I guess I inherited that from my grandmother. She was 88, taking care of a uh, woman that was 96. So she... You know, she worked right up to the very end, and uh, that's probably the way I'm going to be. And I'm fine with that, and I'm fine with people that that want to have time off and enjoy the shelf. Some days I wish I could be 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 like that too, but it's just for some reason it's hard for me to do that. My mind never stops. Some of my ideas have come in the middle of the night. I wake up, I come in my room, and I take some notes or maybe draw something on the computer uh, so that I have a a way to capture that idea. And then, you know, pursue it further when I have more time. But, uh, you know, I love doing this. And I, I don't know what else I would do. Before I started powder coating, I have some hot rods uh, that I would come home and, you know, spend a little time with the wife, eat dinner and stuff, and then go to the garage and work on work on my cars or with my stepson working on his car or something like that. So I've always been like that. It's just this is just a different passion uh, that I found. So let's get into your beginnings and stuff. How did you get started as a custom coder? Um, what's your background? And yeah, give us give us a little bit of that. So I've I started out my career as a machinist, uh, first in the automotive industry, and then moved to the oil and gas industry. It's just more money, um, so it was easy to to eventually make that jump although i didn't enjoy it as much as i did as working on cars basically but you know it it helped pay the bills better so you know 10 15 years go by and uh i was married and had a, a stepson who was 15. we bought him a project vehicle and uh was working on that and of course he wanted to make it faster but we wouldn't let him do that so he wanted to make it look nicer and dress it up do some stuff under the under the hood. And at that time, I told him, I said, well, you know, we can either you can spend money getting stuff chrome plated. Uh, you can get some aluminum pieces and we can try to polish them, you know, because I was wanting to do something to try to teach him some skills mm -hmm. along the way. And I said, or we can buy a little powder coating kit and try to powder coat some of the stuff. And that is literally where the powder coating began. <laughs> I love it. We, we, uh, me and him got a gift together that was the Eastwood, the dual, easy whatever it is, uh, powder coating gun, and we started powder coating in the garage. Just simple stuff at first. That was about ten years ago, and we, you know, we kept working on cars together and powder coating stuff. And back then, Facebook wasn't around, uh, but there were, were forums that you could go join and talk about your passions right. you know and your hobbies and stuff and they had they had build threads so you would start here's where here's the car i got here's where i'm starting and, and go a long way well people seen that, that i was doing the powder coating on our parts and s some other people reached out and hey can you powder coat this bracket for me or this intake for me and and so started doing a little bit on the side got some better equipment in the garage and was getting more and more requests from people and that was probably Fast forward about four years, and I'm working a full-time job in the oil and gas industry that I'd since moved to actually being a, a project manager uh, as I stepped up the ladder over the years. But anyway, I was doing that, and I was pretty much full co uh, powder coating full-time out of my garage. So wow. I had two jobs uh, just because, you know, the hot rod industry, everybody knows everybody around and uh, I was actually doing some work for several shops out of my garage, some little bit of production work, 
And like I say, it was just working two jobs. And the economy finally turned down about five years ago. You know, the oil and gas industry is always up and down. It's mm-hmm. just something you're used to if you're in it. And and that was just part of life. But five years ago, it, it really turned down. Yeah. They had a layoff at uh, the company I was working for. And that six, eight months later, they had another layoff. And, you know, it was get the outlook wasn't getting any better. I reported direct to the owner of the company, and he always assured me that there was nothing to, for me to be concerned about. But, you know, you always have that concern in the back of your mind. So I struck up a deal with him. I was uh, salary, and I told him, let me work half days, take half my salary, and I would s- support myself from with the powder cutting for the rest of my salary. And he was okay with that, took a, a burden off the payroll. Uh, I committed to, you know, fulfilling my responsibilities that I need to at work, even if it was after hours, after I would leave. I'd basically leave at lunchtime. And like I said, I, I reported directly to the owner of the company. We had a good relationship. So did that for about six months and uh, just was driving from uh, our shop to one of the other shops and noticed there was a vacant building that was had some warehouse spaces for lease and just stopped in there and talked to them and it all seemed to be a good fit. Talked to the wife and told her, I think this is time. And five years, a little over five years ago, we made the plunge and went full time. And, you know, haven't really looked back since. Uh-huh. It was very interesting because the weekend that we moved in, Hurricane Harvey, or the weekend before we moved in, Hurricane Harvey decided to come through Houston. So I wasn't sure if we were going to have a shop to move into. I wasn't sure if we were going to have a house to live in uh, or anything, you know. Uh, but it all worked out. The shop was fine. The house was fine. Transition, you know. Had to work my butt off. Not going to lie about that, but uh, you know, here we are five years later and still going strong. Very lucky that we have a good customer base. We do a lot of work for shops, uh, and although we're, I pretty much say we're close to the public. We still take in a few uh, things here and there, but pretty much close to the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't have to, don't have to do any selling. Uh, don't have to do anything. The work just comes in, you know, uh, one job at a time, I guess. Yeah, and it's mostly automotive that you're doing, right? Yes, it's 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 it's, the automotive. It's probably ninety five percent automotive. We get some other stuff in from time to time. Mm -hmm. And how big is your shop? Mostly wheels. Uh, We got a five thousand square foot shop. We started out with twenty five hundred square foot, and a year and a half ago, no, two years ago, we moved the tenant beside us moved out, so we took over their shop as well. Yeah. Well, 5,000 square feet now. That's awesome. Um, So tell me more about this. Um, I'm interested in 3D printing myself, not for myself, but just the process itself. How did you get into that? Did you have some background um, because of the engineering and the other jobs? Or how did that work? What system do you use and then materials? Like, I don't know how. Yeah, so. So as I mentioned, I started out as a machinist. I eventually uh, taught myself how to use uh, AutoCAD, which is a CAD program, and it was just 2D back back in that time. Taught myself how to use that. Uh, happened to get a job at a uh, basically engineering R and D type firm that produced products, but a lot of their work was R and D stuff. Uh, got real uh, close with the owner there. He eventually pulled me into doing designing and uh, CAD work and running the CAD department. In 1999, me and him worked on a project together that he filed uh, for U.S. patent for. So I have a, we were co-inventors on the patent. Uh, It was through the company, so it's all paid for by the company. It was a piece of oil field equipment. Uh, Nothing significant to most people, but, you know, I, I, uh, I was pretty proud of it, still pretty proud of it. Uh, anyway, got more into management. Still, did. I had such a strong background with CNC. I was always uh, basically involved in the machining and building of our products a lot. So eventually, left there. Uh, 
five years worked at another company, five years worked at another company, but always the same engineering type, you know, basically solving problems is what we did. Mm -hmm. And that kind of mentality on the, you know, for the last 20 years, uh, it's just never changed. So every everything I look at, I'm always solving a problem with it, trying to make improvements. And so anyway, the 3D printing, since I had the machining background, the engineering background, all that just came natural. It's just a different type of machine that we're using. Um, so the 3D printers, uh, you can get into them very inexpensively, uh, as little as $100. The software that uh, basically communicates with your computer to the machine. Uh, usually comes with the uh, the printer, or it's a free download to use. The probably the most challenging part is coming up with a design on your own and using CAD software to create that design. There are tons of things that you can uh, download and uh, print straight off the internet through various uh, websites, but they're mostly it's mostly toys. Mm -hmm. and uh, right. stuff like that. It's real popular. There are a lot of people that make a ton of money selling that kind of stuff. So definitely no knock against that. It's just my focus is always uh, more on solving problems and right. making my life easier, which in turn makes other powder coaters' life easier. But anyway, so, so to me, it actually came uh, you know, fairly natural. Uh, a CNC machining, uh, machining center versus a 3D printer are very close to the same as they use the same G-code. It's just a different application of applying that the uh, you're adding material rather than removing it versus machining something. I um, yeah, and so the material that you're using or that gets printed, it's first of all is is it rubber? What's the consist? What is the material? Or does it vary? Uh, we can do a hard plastic and a and a rubbery type. It, it does vary. Generally speaking, uh, most of them are what you'd consider just a hard plastic. There mm -hmm. are some more rubbery type. Uh, they, they refer to as TPU or TPE, basically thermoplastic. And there are some really uh, rubbery materials. There's even machines that can print silicone rubber. Uh, they're mostly used in the medical industry, and they are uh, definitely higher in the range of, of, of pricing. Uh, there's also metal 3D printers that can print metal. Uh, a good friend of mine started a business uh, doing metal 3D printers. And, you know, to put things in perspective, I think a uh, machine to uh, basically produce something that would fit in the palm of your hand was about $100,000 at the time. That was three or four right. years ago. So, you know, that's out of reach for a lot of people. Uh, but the technology is getting there where that's getting uh, more in reach for people. I'm really interested in the silicone uh, 3D printing machines because, you know, we use silicone plugs and, and I see a bunch of uh, opportunity there for silicone masking products, but uh, it's hard to hard to know when the price is going to come down where it's feasible to, to jump into that. Yeah, Ross and, and I had a conversation right. with you about you the other day because I had just set up the interview or was about to with you and you know, I, I explained, I think I saw it in a chat that you were talking about doing the valve cover backs and just customizing every single one of them or having a program that ha could do that um, and stuff. So it um, can you like, would you, if, if that were to come, like if the silicone would come down in price and stuff, would, would you scan it? Uh, is that how you would get it into the CAD? Is you would just scan the 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 dimensions and the the holes and because they're all different sizes, right? So how would right. you go about that? Yeah, I think ultimately on, on stuff like valve covers, that would be the best solution. Uh, one of the things I want to make is masking plugs for the back of wheels. Yeah, uh, those are fairly easy to dimension out and just draw it up in uh, you know the CAD program. So. Complex stuff, yeah, scanning it and turning that into a mold or a that plug would nice. yeah, would, would be the... Anything the, to avoid the taping, right? You know, because yeah. that's really such a long part of it. And now, you know, I don't know if you know this, but my husband broke his hand. So taping is a little harder these days. Oh, yes. uh, and so, like, obviously, you know, he reacted to that uh, with, you know, in regards to doing it that way. 
uh, not just for valve Excellent. covers, but for the backs of wheels and stuff like that, how how innovative that would be. So we're we're rooting for you. <laughs> we're rooting for you. Uh, just in case you kind of dropped in late uh, uh, or you're just getting to this, we're interviewing Scott Coates of uh, Coatings by Coates on Instagram. And uh, we're talking about new products. Um, and I now how much is like your setup like give me like price ranges for these i'm just curious like i never go out and buy anything like that but like the one that you're using is called a bamboo what what sort of like what kind of pricing are we talking about that uh that bamboo is a, a new product actually on the market so let's start there are more entry-level printers i would say you've had to get you buy them uh Let's say there's plenty in the $200 range market. You have to do a little bit of assembly work, uh, put them together, and then, you know, it's after that, it's fairly simple to, to get stuff printing on them. You know, you download the software on your computer. You buy whatever filament you desire. There's a filament called PLA that seems to be the most common uh, filament that people use, and it's, it's very easy to use and expensive, uh, not what you'd call engineering-grade material. Uh, but, yeah, you can... Certainly under $500, you can have a setup and start producing parts. And um, the Bamboo X1 Carbon uh, that I just have been posting about, that one's in the $1,500 range. But it's, it's uh, you know, we're talking about Eastwood guns compared to a Gima gun. <laughs> right. I mean, that's basically the easiest way to make it where people would understand. The lower end Eastwood ones will get the job done and can do a, pretty good job if you work with them enough the higher end one just makes it a lot easier uh, to get good parts out because they're like i say it's just like doing a two-tone wheel you have to gain some experience uh working with the different aspects of the 3d printer and you have to spend some time to get good good products off of it it doesn't just happen automatically the yeah. bamboo makes it a lot closer to happening automatically and uh who knows what they'll be coming out with uh, shortly afterwards. But the Bamboo is basically the app, the iPhone of of the 3D printers. And uh, it's got a lot of new features on it and stuff that make life a lot easier. But yeah, Ender 3 is one of the more common low-cost printers that you can get and start printing right away. There's, there's tons of videos, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, everywhere on 3D printing. And it's something that, that you can get into relatively low cost. A uh, funny story is, though, the first one I, the first 3D printer I bought, instead of buying something simple, I thought, well, I'll buy, I'll use that money to buy something that I have to put together myself completely and right. basically get a box full of parts and build it all. And I did that, and I didn't have enough experience. So I didn't do a good job putting it together. And I didn't have enough time, really, because I was busy. That was when we were first starting out full time powder cutting. So I didn't, I didn't really do a good job putting a printer together. The results I were getting out of it weren't very good. So kind of got a little disappointed in it. And it took probably another year. And me buying a, a printer that was more, more assembled and easier to put, to get up and running, uh, that got me where I needed to really get started going to it. Now, I could have spent more time doing it, uh, but time is something that I don't have a lot of. And uh, since I didn't have that time, I didn't pursue it much further. And once I finally did, uh, you know, things took off pr pretty quickly for me. So, you know, just like powder cutting, you got you to gotta invest the time to get a good, good result at the end. I love your story because mostly because your background led to where you are today. Um, yes. It's, I guess, those that I find interesting, whether I find them on Instagram or in the chat or, you know, on Facebook or whatever, it's like they have this, they have these steps that they didn't know, you know, uh, back then would get them to today, where they are today, right? Uh, 
I love that experience. And I don't know where I'm going with this question, but I mean, what do you have any words for encouragement on people that do want to kind of solve problems for themselves? <laughs> uh, yeah. If you uh, look on my Instagram page, uh, is it possible to pull that up? Yeah, we can do that. Um, the, the one thing is never give up. There's a, uh, uh, so scroll back up towards the top. Let me see this. A little further, a little further. Okay. Right there to the left. This one? No, to the left. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's opposite. Uh, down past the wheel face. You see me with a tool and a black wheel in the background. Yeah. Now you can't you can't hear the music on there, but it, it makes me laugh because there's a song from uh, Snoop Dogg, and he's talk he starts out by saying, uh, basically, most of all, I want to thank me. I want to thank me for not giving well, up. Me, I want to thank let me see me if I for, can do it. Yeah. I want to thank me for having no days oh. off. I want to thank me for for never quitting. I want to thank me. <laughs> there we go. I'm not yeah, sure. you can listen. To this. Yeah. You can listen to more of it on, on my page. And, and if you want some advice, that song is the advice. Don't give up. <laughs> Keep working hard. There's there's some saying that Elon Musk had. I don't know a word for word, but basically he says that if you work 80 hours a week versus 40 hours a week, you're going to accomplish twice as much in your lifetime. And there's just no substitution for hard work. No, and I that, agree with that. A hundred percent. That's me. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's, there's products that I have out now that started out as something that I probably didn't have much faith would work. But I started with something, and then I kept developing it further and further and further until I got it to where it was something that I thought other people would want and that, you know, makes an impact on what you're doing. But that's the biggest thing. Never, never give up. I think that's there's sage been, advice. I mean, it, but the problem, here's the problem. Here's the rub, though with, you know, unfortunately for like, there are people or just a generation, I don't know, like there are people out there that see a lot of Instagram influencers. And we actually did a kind of a podcast on this. Um, I want to say it was podcast 41 or 42 or some 43. And it was like, it, it was like trying to make, you know, trying to get your goals at, accomplished in a very surreal world. Uh, because we do look at you now, right, on this video, and here you are with your own tools that you're selling into the marketplace. And people, I think, just because of digital media availability or access to it, people do think that it happens overnight when it really doesn't. <laughs> and that is yeah. the surrealness of, of our world. Because really what behind, the behind took years in the making, right? Uh, it, it wasn't something that happened overnight. Uh, Ross and I literally could tell you our live story and realize, okay, I can look back at that now, but at the time we were suffering, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or oh, we yeah. were struggling. The struggle is real, right? It, it, and it's mostly 80% struggle, 20%. Until you can get to the innovation part and get it launched and stuff. And there's the whole other thing of it, too. It's like, yeah, OK, you've got these wonderful tools. How do you get them out to the marketplace uh, quickly enough? Or how do you then you maybe might, might be running into production or distribution or, you know, there's a lot of problems to solve even after you make this incredible invention, right? These inventions. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I really need to launch a website. You know, we're selling stuff through Etsy now, which has worked. And I mean, uh, I'm surprised how well it's worked, to be honest with you. Uh, I Most of the videos you see me put together, I literally just finished coating a rack of wheels and rolled them in the oven. And I grabbed this stuff right quick, do a quick video on my iPhone, nothing fancy, and just get the information, you know, basically just getting the information out there as quick as I can. Uh, to, to show off some of the stuff I'm working on. And, you know, that may look clumsy, has ha haphazard sometimes, but it also, you know, it's real. You know, yeah. this is, this, 
this is no different than some other person in their powder coating shop, you know, facing some of their um, hurdles that they have to face every day. So, so, so I guess I do try to keep it real. <laughs> right. I'm going to try to flip over to um, sharing your uh, Etsy shop, uh, shop, I guess, is really what it is. Um, and most yeah, and of these I... products are like totally affordable. Like they're not thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars. Yeah, there's a, that's what been one of my goals too. I, I still go back to the mentality of when I was working in my garage starting out, you know, I, I couldn't afford a GEMA. Uh, money was uh, more important for other things than the tools that I would be needing out, out in the garage. So I still try to keep it affordable for people, uh, even if they're the guys still working in the garage. So mm -hmm. a lot of us started there. And even even nowadays, you know, I still have to uh, be efficient with where we spend our money you can't just blow and go uh like it was <laughs> in the oil field there's so much money wasted there it's almost as bad as the government uh so I, it, it, uh, I, I try to be like i say very conscious of what other people can afford and there's some products on there that we really by the time we package it up and ship it out and do the testing we really don't make that much money off of it but they may be looking on our Etsy page and buy that product and buy another product. So it kind of, kind of offsets it and, uh, you know, helps it all, all work out in the end. Yeah. I, um, I, and it's, you're keeping up with your orders and stuff like that seems like, um, and everything. So, uh, let me pop that up on the, well, this is your Etsy store, but I was going to just kind of say, there's your Instagram coatings by coats uh at uh Insta on instagram so uh yeah i just want to jump in and say on my instagram page in our bio is the link to our etsy store yeah uh, no matter how many videos i post it's a link in sale uh, people still seem to miss it so if you go to my uh Instagram page is in the bio. If you go to my personal Facebook page, it's in the, in my bio. If you go to my TikTok account, it's in my bio. So it's always yeah. in my bio to get to our page. And this is the page, the Etsy page. Yeah. Yes. And also, uh, if you look, uh, the second one from the left, that's uh, it's not a new product, but that's a, a combo kit we're doing now. This uh, one here? No, one one over to the left. The oh. where it's got the four pictures in it. Okay, yeah. So that's mm -hmm. our that's our combo kit. If you're listening and you haven't bought any of our products, that's the best money for your value uh, because we put all those together and it gives you a slight discount versus purchasing them separate. So that's everything for our shop vac uh, setup that we offer. So you get the whole yeah. package by just ordering that one one item. Now it shows $110. Uh, that's for part of it. So basically, if somebody's already bought our shop vac attachment attachment kit like you see over on the right they don't have to buy that again they can buy just right. all of the attachments that we now offer so right. there's a drop down menu in there that lets them pick either the whole thing with the shop oh, kit, okay yeah yeah, uh, yeah. hoses and everything or you can buy just the uh the whole setup of attachments that we now have and yeah i see all the uh, tips now that you have it's like you keep expanding on the different kinds of tips based on the products and yeah, stuff or yeah. the projects that you're doing yeah probably the most popular though is the uh uh the flexible attachments and the uh extractor the powder extract kit those will will pay for themselves the powder extractor kit i promise people literally the first set of two-tone wheels they use that on it will pay for itself in the time that they say Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I see that already just uh, in terms of like what you've developed so far. And I know you're going to I know you've probably got in your secret lab some even more goodies in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've, I've I've got at least 10 different things that I'll be working on, you know, this next year coming up. Uh, don't want to really spill the beans on any of them yet. No, no. I, wanna... I want you to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but definitely going to be some more exciting stuff next year. And, uh, you know, I, I also get a bunch of feedback from other 
powder coaters, and that's where I've developed some of my product from. The booth holster uh, is one of those products that one of my customers uh, named Rich, he <laughs> he had bought some of our products, and he sent me a picture, I think. I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I believe he sent me a picture with his gun, and the hook was broken off of it. And he said, if you could figure out a way to basically remedy that problem, uh, you know, it would be nice. And that's kind of where the booth holster de- developed from. Uh, Paul Foster of AV Powder Coating in Arizona mm-hmm. gave me the idea for the pneumatic uh, vac. So any and all feedback is always welcome because, like I say, even a, an idea that doesn't sound like a good idea initially can turn into a good idea. It's true. Um, and I, I think there are many gaps in our industry right now. And I also think there is a lot of opportunity, a lot. Um, if oh, yeah. you can think think through things effectively enough, either through solving problems at your shop or solving industry problems in general, you know, uh, I yep. think there's a lot of forward movement um, happening or going to happen if not happening already. So, yeah, um, this is awesome. I, I I'm so glad it's what's taken us so long. Anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're all too busy. I know it's really hard to get custom coders on the show and stuff, but I certainly do appreciate you guys, you coming on and your wife managing that Etsy shop uh, and stuff. I know it's been, uh, you know, I know you've been bombarded with orders and trying to just keep up with it all, but I think it's awesome that you're doing what you're doing because it's more than just making a quick buck off of a new product. It's trying to, evolutionize or revolutionize our industry no matter how big or small yeah if i was just trying to do it just for the money i would just just print products that were already released like the toys and stuff i'd mentioned you know and just put those up for sale but that's not really where i'm interested and i i do i am trying to my end goal is to eventually let my son take over the powder coating business and step away from that for the most part and just do uh the product development and you know sell these these products you know i think we're at 20 products now next year i want to be at 100 products wow and after that i want to be you know at 200 you know the year after that i want to be at 200 products that may be be a little bit of a reach but uh you know i set high goals for myself to keep the pressure on and uh, definitely going to be coming out with more stuff next year well you are truly an inspiration and i'm glad we're kind of um as we're recording this uh, probably won't get published until the new year, but I'm very excited to have you because you're you're an inspiration to me and our community, especially at the beginning of the year, you know, uh, because we should all be thinking about goal setting right now. And I'm happy yeah. that you are uh, talking and you have some really big goals that you want to achieve. It's not easy to hand over your custom coding shop that you've worked hard at to a family member or a new person. I mean, we've just hired someone new that we're hoping to kind of foster and, you know, develop into someone that could be that person like your son maybe in the future. And so uh, it's not easy to kind of let that go or or know or have things in place that ass- give you assurance that if you do step away, it's not all going to come falling down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, I'll stick around with it as long as I can. I'm going to uh, make sure he has every possible opportunity to succeed, uh, you know, when, when the time comes. Well, I'll tell you, that's a show in and of itself right there, Scott. So <laughs> we'd love to have you come back and talk about that as well as your other new products and, and everything. So thanks again so much for making time. I know it's Christmas time, a holiday time for all of us. And I really appreciate the time that you do have because you could be spending it, you know, doing something else right now. <laughs> well, not not a problem at all. I'm sorry that it's taking this long, but I, I think when we first started talking, I really didn't have as many products out as I would have liked to have had. And I, I felt my time was best working on getting more out there uh, for everyone. And, you know, now, like I said, we've got 20 products out there and, and uh, uh, it's it's moving along at a good pace and i want to say thank you to all of my customers 
and uh, y'all have just been great. The feedback, you know, I get some funny uh, responses and tags and in Instagram and TikTok and Facebook that that really make me laugh someday uh, with the comments and uh, you know, really people just don't realize how much that means to me. Um, one one gentleman in particular, uh, he did one of the screen shares on TikTok where he's just pulling his wallet out and throwing money at, at the, <laughs> the camera, you know, for our products. Uh, and that just made my day. That was when I released the Mac back. So that was pretty, uh, pretty uh, overwhelming, you know, with emotions on, on stuff like that. So I do appreciate everybody uh, and all the customers. And we do everything we can uh, to make sure, you know, if there things do happen uh, with our products, uh, some, We've had some get damaged during shipping, and we do everything within our power to make it not just right, to make it better than right. Uh, and we'll continue to always do that. That's the same way I run my powder coating business, and that's the same way that I'm running my Etsy business, too. Awesome. I love it. Well, thanks for joining us today, and we're certainly going to have you back on again because you've been a pleasure, and it's so good to know your story. Uh, we're interviewing uh, Scott Coates at... Instagram coatings by coats and in his Instagram profile is a link to his shop. He sells new products that are and attachments that go to either helping you do two tone wheels a little easier or etching out uh, and doing different colored, well, different colored tones on the lettering on wheels and just vacuum them off, off all that extra powder that you don't need when you're powder coating. So thanks so much for joining us today and have a beautiful day. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.